Ian, could you possibly close those doors? Thank you so much. They're a very noisy crowd out there. It's those 5G people. Thank you. Okay. So, do you want to talk to me? Um, let me have a slide. I can talk through some of the issues once again to the. Okay. All right. So, this is HTTP. Um, this is the note well. Uh, once again, if you're not familiar with this, you can find this by going to your preferred search engine on the internet and uh, searching for ITF note well. And it will tell you about uh, our expectations regarding intellectual property and people's behavior and handling of things like harassment. So please do be aware of this. These are all policies which we do take seriously and apply. The blue sheets are circulating. Did we get a volunteer for scrubbing? We did not. Oh, dear. Would anyone like to volunteer for note taking as, and then also have someone else on Jabber scribing? You can do Jabber. Jabber scribe. We still need a scribe. So note taking, please. Anyone? We'll be going through the various extension you, drafts. It'll be a lot of fun. You didn't say no. Oh, Mike, thank you. You're 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 a gentleman. That's fine. Uh, agenda bash. So um, I wanted to do a quick reprise of stuff that had happened in other groups. If someone would be willing. Uh, I'll, I'll talk briefly about what happened in Sec Dispatch because I was there. If someone else could talk about what happened in DNSOP regarding the uh, 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 new record type, uh, very briefly, that would be really appreciated. Um, anybody willing to do that? I mean, I can talk about it. You can talk about it? Okay, you were there. Okay, great. Then we're going to have a short uh, update on what happened, continued to happen in the priorities discussion. We we'll spend the bulk of our time talking about our, our in flight extension drafts. And then we have a presentation, a uh, proposal for new work around compression dictionaries, which we talked about before. This is just uh, a further step in that discussion. And finally, as time permits, there is a proposal for a transport info header that we might get to. Uh, any other agenda bashing? Okay, let's get right into it then. Uh, so in SEC Dispatch, uh, there were two interesting discussions. Uh, one was regarding uh, uh, request signing. Uh, we've had on our agenda, uh, or rather on our, our watch list of, of things that we're, we're keeping an eye on, uh, ahead of the uh, draft cabbage request signing uh, for some time. H H draft cabbage HTTP request signing, I think. Um, and there was a discussion in SEC Dispatch. I think the, the information that we got there was that there is a fairly large community of people with, with requirements in this space and interest, and there's some forward impetus. And so the discussion there recommended that they bring that draft here so we can expect probably a revised draft uh, to appear sometime soon, and then we'll look at doing a call for adoption or talking about it more if need be. Uh, the other discussion there uh, was around uh, identifying uh, the credentials in a forward hop from a proxy, and that there wasn't any certainty around whether that was going to be at the TLS layer or the HTTP layer, but it did come up a little bit, so just keep an eye on that space. Something might happen. Uh, DNS op. Right, so in DNS op, we had um, a presentation from the team working on the HTTPS service record or the service binding record or whatever it's going to be en ending up being called. Um, that document has been presented here, but now it has been adopted in the DNS op group. Um, it seems to be progressing well. There's um, good discussion on a lot of the details there. Um, there's going to be bike shedding on the names, so if people have particular opinions on that, you can chime in on that list. And it looks like that's going to be on track to um, kind of start finalizing that format and the um, trying to get like an early allocation for some some of the points there. So if you, I would encourage this group to look at the way it's going to be encoding ALPN values and other things. Make sure that is in line with what we expect because that may be being locked down around now. Okay. Uh, relaying uh, an agenda bash, uh, Yoav Weiss uh, asks if the client hints can run a little bit early. Sure, thanks Thanks for that. He, he asked about that uh, earlier offline. Uh, I think we'll do client hints first when we do the extensions, and that should hopefully address his needs since he's remote. Thank you. <coughs> um, so priorities, Ian, are you going to cover that? And did you send updated slides? Yes, last 
Is it this one, priorities? Uh, no. Did you send it as a pull request? No. Mm, he emailed it. Nah. I got it right here. OK. Hold on a second, then. I mean, I can share it up, too. Sorry? Oh, yeah. Oh. Uh, Apple magic is now happening. We'll see if that. <laughs> I don't know. How do I turn this thing on? Oh, on that thing. So this is exciting. I could have put anything in these. <laughs> All right. No? Uh, yeah. Excuse me while my computer is taken over by anyone in the room. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, we had some continued discussions and then lunch uh, after the last priorities discussion. Uh, that ended up, I think, being quite productive. And then uh, the, the authors and contributors to the design team kind of tried to make as many updates to the draft as possible. And Kazuo kindly pushed out an update last night, which we already got some good feedback on. Next slide. Um, it's the same scheme we discussed before. We did a little bit of renaming. We made it a little bit terser uh, with the expectation that you don't actually need to spell out incremental and urgency or progressive uh, to save bytes in the wire. I think Martin Thompson has a suggestion we can make it terser still, but um, you know that's for, for later. That's kind of a detail issue. Uh, but the overall scheme has not changed since earlier in the week. Next slide. Um, so I think we the goal of the draft update really was trying to clarify this fact. So uh, there's one scheme, it's the same format, but there's two ways to convey it. If you want end to end, you should use a header. And if you want hop by hop, you should use a frame. And those are your two options. If you, headers are slightly more suited to initial prioritization, they can be sent by either side. Um, and they allow you to, I think I lost some text on that one. Sorry, it's sort of an override does not make sense, just ignore that. Um, Frames are designed for reprioritization. Uh, they can only be sent by the client or the intermediary. Um, so for example, in these cases we discussed before where you want an end to end signal of what the client priority is, uh, but on a given hop you want to say, ah, uh, like, you know, on this hop I want a different priority, you can use a frame to reprioritize the request. And this fits exactly with the end to end versus hop by hop distinction. Next slide. So just to be clear, when you say sent by client or intermediary, you mean sent by client, including as an intermediary? Yes. Just yes. in that one direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, it cannot, it cannot be sent uh, corresponding to a response, at least as the draft is currently written. I'm not sure if that restriction needs to stay, um, but I think no one's come up with a killer use case for it. So I think we'll keep it well until someone does. Um, so we simplified the negotiation using settings. Uh, the current goal of this uh, went back to the original goal of uh, the draft that was at the last IETF, which is if it's one, it should be two priorities are deprecated and urgency is supported. Um, therefore, don't send those frames anymore. That's pretty much all the functionality you're getting at this moment. Uh, future values could be defined for uh, the setting if we wanted to you know, do other things with it, but for now, it's really just there to say, like, I support the new thing. I don't support the old thing. Stop sending the old thing. Um, and it can be sent by either side. And that's it. So I think the plan going forward, then, is we can expect a revised draft in the very near future, correct? Or is that is that It was, re the re it was revived last, last night. Right. And so that's, as far as you're concerned, that's done. Um, that encompasses all the changes I've talked about are in there, and it's, it clarifies a variety of issues. I think it's not done. I mean, oh, of course, but yeah, yeah. in terms of, of reflecting the, the state of the discussion to date, yes, I think okay. this is at least the technical aspects. Yeah. Okay. Then I think the plan going forward is we do a call for adoption on that, um, pretty much now. Yeah. And uh, uh, once we adopt it, we start the discussion on it. Okay. Yeah. That sounds good, Martin. Martin Thompson. Um, I think Kazuo answered my questions about the structure of the, the header field reasonably well. Uh, I think there remains a little bit of question about the frame and the value of that. Um, I raised that issue on the list. I saw some feedback on that point, but I don't think that should stop us from adopting this work. I think that's enough of a, a separable piece that we can excise or enhance as, as needed. Right. Um, to clarify, Martin, if you could, um, 
So is your concern about the frame just kind of the nature of the frame, or is it more that there are just like two mechanisms to communicate the same thing? So there, there are two mechanisms that, that exist here, and, and yeah. we kind of know a lot about the first one, and Robin pointed to the research that he did and all, all those wonderful things. But the other one we've had for the longest time, and we never had any, any, um, anything to back that in the first place, and we still don't have anything to back that, and it's extra complexity. So... Um, so I'm can you include doing that. which which the second way? What are the what the, the frame? The re, the idea that you might send a, 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 a hop by hop signal. So, or, sorry, I'm going to cut the queue. We do not have a lot of time to talk, yeah. discuss this. It's I, not a weapon. I, I don't want to. I want. I don't want to okay. litigate this at length. But I want to say that there is um, there's a question about that one. But I don't think it should stop us from adopting it. Andy Grover, Mozilla. I just uh, wanted to mention that. Um, so using the word deprecated, that usually means that the old thing is still okay, it's just not preferred. Whereas I think you want to say it's like obsoleted or something. No? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. The, right. I think the text is clear about what that means, but yeah, it, right. more clarity may be needed. Briefly, please. Robin. Yeah, Roland Marx, I just wanted to clarify that we now also use the frame for the hop by hop semantics. So it's no longer just for reprioritization. It's also used for other things that we spent a long time discussing in the design team. Uh, and if we remove the frame, we would have to go back and figure out that, which I don't yes. think anyone wants to do. Okay. So I agree. I, I want to stress that this is a proposal from a design team. I know a lot of the folks who are very active were involved in that, which is great. But it doesn't mean there's any kind of consensus reflected in that. And when we do a call for adoption, that's a signif signifying that the working group is working on this item now, not necessarily that we have consensus on the contents of the document. So that's the frame of mind we should go into this. Of course, we're going to discuss the issues. Um, we talked before about the possibility of an interim meeting to ha hammer this out. Had, I had a few hallway chats, and we talked about that. I don't know that that's going to be necessary at this time. And we've talked about if we do, uh, you know, I think everyone wants to get this up pretty quickly. Um, yes. For quick and for other reasons. Yep. Um, but if it, we're, we're talking that if we do need to have some sort of meeting, we might try one or a series of virtual interims where we, we do this on the phone. And I think we can maybe exploit the fact that a lot of these folks do know each other to, to, to try that out. Um, so if you have any feedback on that, talk to Tommy and myself. But that's the plan going is, is if it's needed, that's probably what we, what we will do. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Ian. So don't book those tickets to Zurich if, you, if this is all you're interested in. Okay, my computer's still open for attack, so let me just, yeah, there we go. Um, next up, extension drafts. Um, so we said we would go with Yov first. Yov, are you with us? Can you request to be seen? Or actually, let's do it here. Paging your voice. Let's see if he's. Huh. Oh. This computer is. Oh, are we frozen? Maybe frozen. Although it's still reflecting video. It is. Okay. Oh. So has he requested yet? or? Okay. All right. Why don't we move to another one while he figures that out then? So if we go to the listing, I'm going to just go straight down. Um, digest headers. That's another remote presentation from Roberto. Roberto, are you with us? Sorry? Oh, it's you. Oh, OK, sorry. Come join us. <laughs> Yov, we'll do you right after digest. Um, okay, so I realized five minutes ago there's a slight slide ordering error in this, so it okay. appears the slides finish way before they do. So um, I fixed that with the PR, but I can just do this just to be aware of it. So this is uh, yeah digest headers, which was called resource digest, which used to be RFC 3230. 
Um, next slide, please. Um, so just, just a brief recap, if you have not read the draft or forgotten it, um, this is just a way to provide a, a hash on a request or a response header. So we've got this digest header, and in there you would signal the digest algorithm that you're using, and then the encoded digest output. And what that is, is the application of that algorithm over a the representation, say, or some part of the body of the uh, or the payload of the request or response. But the format of that thing uh, is dependent upon the digest algorithm that you've used. So it's typically base64 or some other thing. Um, just something to keep in mind as we go through. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, last time around when we presented in Montreal, um, Roy asked for some use cases. Um, we haven't put them explicitly in the draft. We've put in um, like broad ideas of how it could be used, and that's something I'll come on to later. But today, as far as we're aware, these are the kinds of things that are, are using digest, mice, uh, signatures, um, which is an issue that we'll explore a little bit more, and things like banking APIs. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we had draft zero zero, and in since Montreal, we've been working on some updates. We had some open issues that we presented last time, so we've been trying to address those. Um, we've not fixed them all, but um, we have this draft. Uh, I took a stab at an editorial sweep um, before we cut draft 01. Um, we're aware there's still some editorial issues we'd like to resolve. The readability of the document could be improved. Um, so I really appreciate any feedback on that. But if people don't want to take a, a full read of this document, um, that's fine because it's difficult. But if you've got an opinion on some of the issues we present, I'd really appreciate feedback on that because we can resolve those and then and then figure out how best to reword this document or, or make things better. So I just wanted to deal with that first. The, I'll step through the changes we've made very quickly. So one, the first is clarifying state changing methods. Um, the second was a reboot of the digest algorithm IANA table. And then the third one was uh, a consideration section effectively for the relationship between digest and SRI, which stands for sub-resource integrity. This was um, opened by Martin basically during the Montreal thing. I don't know if what we have there is everything we need, but it's about the best I could do given the discussion and the information available. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so to, to go through these, what, what does clarifying state changing methods mean? We had issue 853, um, and basically what we've said is post and patch requests convey actions, not partial representations. So a digest header on a post or patch request um, is calculated or computed um, over the representation data of the actions um, there. And in responses, it's calculated on the selected representation of the referenced resource. This might be the enclosed one or the selected representation. Uh, for example, in the case of no content. What does any of that mean? Um, if you go to the next slide, we have a post example. Um, so we're posting some stuff that's some JSON, and we, we tell the server what we would accept. But we, we're posting this thing, title, a new title, and that request, sorry, that digest header is calculated on the enclosed representation of the request. The response that comes back has a different hash, because um, it's calculated on the enclosed representation in the response, which is a completely different thing. If you go to the next one, this is patch. This is very similar. We're submitting a JSON patch, which is RFC 7396. Uh, we want a similar kind of response, um, but the thing we're sending is the same rep, uh, same payload as the post, but we're given the instruction to patch a document. And therefore, the response we get back in this case is different than both the patch document and the representation from the post example. Clarification, uh, Julian Reschke says, we should be clear that post and patch are not special cases. This should be true for all methods. That's, that's good. You beat me by two slides. So um, if we go on to the final example here, um, this is with a 204. So what this is trying to show is it's exactly the same digest header as, as the previous patch example in the response, but you, 
we didn't have any payload. We didn't need one. So this is one of the advantages of digest is you can set this thing. So that said, having gone to the effort of giving some examples for post and patch, we go on to the next slide. Uh, Julian said, I don't think that we, it would be a good idea to vary the semantics based on the request method. Uh, so we can address this with some rewording, but should we? Um, yeah, and yeah, this is Roberto's com comment. Does it present, is, I guess, is it present on, sorry, methods that exist today or may be invented in the future um, convey a partial representation? And if so, the digest should always be computed on the complete representation. That's probably some form of the text we might put in there. So uh, I, we, I, we can come back to this. But if we go to the next slide, ha, no, next slide. Um, <laughs> the, the discussion doesn't end there, as you all see. Um, so uh, change two, this is, this is really simple stuff. We have a, uh, basically, as part of the changes in this document compared to the, the RFC that we're updating, um, we want to obsolete or deprecate some algorithms. So we just update the table to have a new column that can contain this status. Uh, and we're deprecating MD5 and obsoleting SHA and Adler 32. This is something we actually considered when um, getting the document adopted um, and changing from the, well, anyway, we didn't because Mark told us don't do that. And then to try and address it as, as part of a zero, one to zero, uh, zero, zero to zero one update so that actually we could incorporate the feedback of the working group and all of that stuff. So that was fine. Um, uh, we've done some of this stuff. I think it's all pretty straightforward. Change three, the next slide. Oh, no. Again? Did you skip, did you skip a slide? I did not. Okay. Oh, well. Um, we'll go on to the open issues that we, we, we need input on. Um, I can go through them all. Uh, I don't know how we're doing for time. Uh, we probably don't need to discuss all of them today. I just want to give people some awareness of the challenges we're facing. Um, if you've got uh, any strong inspiration on helping us get to that answer, it'd be fantastic. So uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, this is cache digest and cache validators. Um, you've got RFC 3230 stating that the instance is specified by the request URI and any cache validator contained in the message. Um, but we've updated digests to, to, to use the, the more recent TIMS in 7230X. So rather than cache validator, we say just validator. But how do validators specify a resource and is specify the correct term? Mark? Mark? Yeah. So, um, you know, just listening to, to the issues you're having here, it seems to me that part of the mismatch here might be that, that this document is, you know, 3230 was part of the instance digest work, and that was based upon a uh, terminology and an and architecture of HTTP that was very specific to instance digests, and we did a lot of work in HTTP BIS to move further away from that. And I'm, I'm wondering if Roy and, and Julian and maybe myself, but more Roy, can help uh, align the terminology in current HTTP BIS with what's happening here, because I think that would resolve actually a lot of these issues. Does that make sense to you, Roy? Because like, for example, here, this seems like select, selected representation. It shouldn't be about the cache validator. Ah, oh, jeez. I mean, it, it, would it depends on what we're talking about. Um, so if we're talking about what would be on the back end of the server that uh, you're doing a cache or a digest on the back end of what the selected representation is, then yes, you would use selected representation. If you're talking about what you're sending in the payload, then you would talk about something else. Yeah. Um, so. I, just, I, I suspect that a lot of the terminology you're looking for might already be buried in HTTP, BIS, and core. Okay, and, and to be clear, that that's the the whole intention of this document update is to get us aligned, mm -hmm. so people aren't questioning this, and and yeah. we can just get it and get it done, and not need to revisit. Right. I think we need to help you out. Yeah. Um, so that'd be greatly appreciated. Yeah. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, using digests and signatures. So one of the main uses for digests is with signatures. Um, we provide very minimal guidance, saying that you know. Uh, Use some transport integrity, sign data and metadata, avoid the broken algorithms when you're, you're generating the digest, but that's it. Um, you know, some people are saying maybe we, we could provide further guidance on signatures, um, especially related to 
representation metadata that affects the selected representation. So what this means is if you're going to calculate a signature over some metadata fields to protect them, you sh and, and that includes the digest, you should um, include the other headers that relate to that digest. Um, but I don't feel strongly on if we really need to do this in this document itself. Yeah, Martin Thompson, don't do that. Um, the <laughs> signature work's going to be hard enough already, and they're going to have to grapple with all those problems. Content length, by the way, is a really bad example because that's typically included in the hash in other ways. So you don't need to worry about Thank that. Thank you. <laughs> Next um, slide, please. Uh, somebody asked, could we add a threat model? This might have been Jeffrey. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, is that useful? Should we put it in the ID? We've got some candidate texts on a PR somewhere. Um, so it's, it's really just trying to understand. Can we just close it? Not needed. Um, or maybe the, the text is on an issue and we could move that into a PR and then put it out for review or consider some broader thing, which is related to the signatures, mm. which we just said we didn't want to do. Yeah, Martin Thompson, again, this is going to be a little bit tricky to do. Uh, there is sort of one level where you simply say that I, I want to make sure that this hasn't been modified in transit. But if you start getting into the threat model proper, then you have to worry about the signature and the, and the, and the downstream uses of all of this. So I would prefer not to do anything on this particular one. It's, okay. I guess, concentrate on building the building block and then we'll worry about how that's composed into various weapons later on. Okay, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this one is, is more of a stylistic thing, I guess. Uh, digest over an empty representation. It's, it sounds simple, but you know we're, we're trying to add some examples into this document, um, like them or lo load them. So if we were to do that, um, just because you've got an empty representation doesn't mean that the thing that's sent on the wire is empty. Um, and that affects the digest value as it's calculated. So here's two examples that you know we, we're taking an empty string um, versus an empty string that's compressed with something and th they come out as two different digests. So th this can happen, but should we basically create a, uh, I don't know, the, the canonical in encoding of this thing that people can use when they're trying to figure this out? Or do we just don't care, leave it? Yeah, Martin Thompson again, uh, it is what it is. If the selected representation or what representation data payload uh, <laughs> is is a certain number of bytes, then it's a certain number of bytes. And in the compressed case, when you compress the empty string, you get something. So obviously, that's otherwise you wouldn't have this problem. So uh, I don't think we need to worry about it. Okay. Uh, I know that we have something in the in the mice draft that specifically addresses the empty case, but that's because that has um, specific requirements around that. So, yeah. yeah, and um, like I'm not super familiar with this issue. If you go on there, we do link to the discussion that happened between I think you, Jeffrey, and David Benjamin around some of those things. So, um, but I think that's a different problem. Yeah, yeah. So, next slide, please. Uh, the this is a fun one. Uh, the RSC thirty two thirty, the one we're updating, states the following. Um, and, and we just import that text verbatim into the updates. For, so for some algorithms, one or more parameters may be supplied. Here's the, an example of the digest algorithm. Uh, and it says the BNF for parameter is as used in blah, but that, that document doesn't provide any example anywhere. Um, and, and the reference to the BNF there needs updating anyway. So we, we should have something for you to reference in court. We've recently, I think, closed an issue on that. Okay, that's cool. Uh, next slide, please. There is no next slide. Oh, well, we're done. Um, so that's <laughs> it. Um, oh, hold on. Yeah, yeah thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Keep it up. Um, I think uh, this, this spec, I, I've seen a lot of activity. Uh, the editor's mm -hmm. been very busy. It's great. I think it's going to get to a stage soon where it's going to need wider review. I think people can engage on the issues now. Once they do a bit more editorial work, uh, um, we, need, we need better review from folks. Jabber Relay. Uh, I think Roberto Poli would like to jump the queue to speak, if possible, oh. before Yoav presents. If, if we can do it quickly, we're running behind time. Um, I don't know how to do that on can this. Can we just thing. let him through and then cancel? Yeah, Yoav, we're going to get rid of you, but we'll get you right back. Honest. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Can you can, hang up? Can you? Oh, yeah. 
I tried <laughs> pressing again in it. Oh wait, Thorco. Okay. Oh, oh no. no. Roberto, yeah, Roberto, queue Roberto. up again, please. It's all about latency. <laughs> Roberto? Okay. Yov, why don't you go ahead and give it a try then? Okay. He won. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Sorry. But, uh, <laughs> let's go ahead and let you know, talk about client hints and, and we can come back. Hey, hi. Uh, so, yeah, I want to talk about uh, client hints. Uh, so, a few changes to the draft that has happened uh, between uh, 07, which I think was published in, back in March. Uh, we clarify the define that the defined headers are response headers, replace key references with key references with variants, and replace the ABNF with structured headers. Uh, none of that was particularly controversial. Um, as a result of feedback uh, that we got at the IETF 105, we remo removed the explicit except CH lifetime um, header and replaced it with implicit uh, registration that is tied to the life of session cookies. Uh, next slide. Um, another PR that has just landed uh, as a result of feedback uh, is to add, a <coughs> basically outline the byte size cost of adding hints uh, and therefore cautioning uh, implementers as well as servers that um, you know hints have a cost and therefore um, they should be used in moderation. Next slide. And we have a couple of pending PRs that I believe are close to being done, um, but. I would love the group's uh, opinions on them and what more is needed there. Uh, one is uh, detailed dimensions of information exposure. Uh, this is a PR that um, outlines uh, what exactly, what categories of information uh, can be exposed in client hints. Uh, what categories of information must not be exposed as a client hint and um, define what uh, implementers and features that will be using this infrastructure uh, should take into account when doing that. Um, so I believe this is close to being done, uh, but I'd love opinions from, uh, from the group and particularly uh, Martin Thompson, I know like you've been active on this issue. I'd love to know if there's anything else uh, that needs to be done there uh, so we, that we can wrap it up. Um, the, second, uh, the second PR uh, still being worked on is uh, adding a sec prefix for security considerations. I think this is active discussion that happen, but um, essentially uh, we think that in order to make sure that those client handles are uh, adding a second metric will give us that guarantee and make sure that those headers are not being used somewhere today. Unlike um, and we are aware of the fact that this prevents uh, user based variants, mm -hmm. but we um, yeah, sorry about that. yeah, um, Martin Thompson. Yeah, I, um, thanks. 
Thanks for summarizing that. This is a difficult one. Uh, and I, I think it's probably, I can probably try to explain where I'm at to, up to on, on the thinking here. Mm -hmm. um, the sec prefix prevents sites from setting this value themselves. Only the browser can do it. That's really the property that we're looking for. Yeah. And part of, part of the, uh, the concern that we have is that if we allow sites to set arbitrary headers, particularly in cross origin requests, then the server at the other end may be unprepared to receive those particular header fields and may do something that maybe we are uncomfortable with the consequences of. It might be a security vulnerability, who knows. Uh, and th that is coupled here with the desire to have these header fields available on the very first cross origin request made to any given origin. Is that a reasonable summary of where you're at? So you were trying to load an image from a cross origin um, source and you want to make sure that they get, for instance, the DPR hint so that they can make the right choice of uh, representation. Mm, yes, so we want to avoid pre-flights as that would neg negate uh, a lot of the performance benefits that this will, um, the client hints will have, as well as introduce a, per a significant performance regression for hints that don't help for performance, such as user agent hint, client hints. Right. So um, I guess this is a bit unfortunate, but I've been having a bunch of discussions with um, Anna van Kesteren and, and, and others about what it is that we do with origin policy, other ways of signaling origin policy, potentially using things like a, a flag in the, in the TLS handshake that indicates that the server is willing to um, willing to accept the consequences of uh, dealing with things like the pre-flights itself. Um, those are where I would prefer to put my effort into acknowledging the fact that if we allowed these uh, header fields to go, that means that currently we'd be in the situation of having to decide whether they're pre-flighted at the mo at, for the ones that we have in here, yeah. it, it, even though it might be just for a, a short term, <clears throat> period of time. Because what I don't want to lose here is the utility that we get out of being able to have applications set them in those contexts where it is indeed valuable to, to have that information available to the server. And uh, I threw a couple of examples in the, in the thread there, and I. Uh, they're just straw man examples, but I think that that having that capability is something that I would prefer to keep, even if it means maybe in the short term having this exposure to the ne necessity of pre-flights until we have a better understanding of how this works. Uh, I realize that's kind of springing on you, Jov, but um, that's all discussions I've had in the past week or two trying to try to chase this particular problem down. It's really quite a thorny one. Okay. Um, do you have any specific use cases in mind regarding the um, like user land based client hints? Is yeah, there uh, the example that I gave was um, the case where you have essentially a service worker that's preloading content available for offline, and it wants to be able to explicitly say that it wants the smaller or the saved data representations because it's worried about the, the time that it's going to take or um, the amount of space it's going to, going to need, that sort of thing. Um, or maybe it wants to prepare for a situation where it's in a, a more limited context or maybe it wants to move that, that data elsewhere and give it to a more constrained device. I don't know, but it has these constraints on, on the data and it wants to express that and use the client hints and hit the cache in the right way and all those sorts of other wonderful things. So um, that was the example I had. I think I'd probably come up with some more of them if you really like, but um, that was the example I had. Okay. Um... Would a solution where um, browser-based client hints have a SAC prefix and then user land-based client hints that are willing to take uh, the pre-flight cost don't have the SAC prefix, but they have the same semantics, would something along those lines work? And so that's one that I'm <laughs> reluctant to do because that means that now you have two things that essentially mean the same thing. Uh, but they're distinguished based on where they came from and we have to carry that baggage forever. Uh, I, I realize that this is unfortunate, but I would, I would rather try to solve the problem than, than have to 
have to deal with it in this in this kind of ugly way. This sec prefix is kind of horrific, uh, and it's it's a blunt instrument, unfortunately, and that's what I'm trying to avoid. Okay, thank you. Any more slides? Uh, um, yeah, so next slide is basically, <laughs> I don't know. I would love to see that infrastructure draft uh, move further along. Um, I am planning to um, ship uh, user agent client hands in Chromium very shortly uh, based on the new infrastructure uh, that's outlined in this draft, as well as the um, feature policy uh, related infrastructure of uh, cross-origin delegation. Um, so, yeah, I would, I'd love to see this move further. Martin Thompson, if I might offer a potential out, you don't actually define any clients, client hints in here. And um, I confess I was unable to find any of them when I lo went looking the other day. Um, so you've done a great job of removing them. Uh, they seem to have disappeared from the internet. But um, <laughs> the, um, that means that we probably can not concentrate on whether the sec prefix is something that we use and simply say that we have to, uh, w when you define a client hint, you need to ensure that the server is not going to fall over as a result of receiving one of these things in the web context. And we can be very lightweight about this because this is an infrastructure document. And that makes this primarily a problem for the fetch spec or whatever document ends up defining the individual hints. Uh, I realize that's kind of kicking the can down the road, but I think it might be kicking it ex exactly into the right yeah. location. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. So you have, um, do you have enough to make a, modify the pull request to make a new pull request based on that to kind of scope that? I, I believe so. Um, yeah, for the, for the SAC uh, PR. Yes. Um, and, yeah. and for the other one, it looks like mainly the comments on there were seem to be about the fact that we are adding kind of normative text in. You should avoid these various um, fingerprinting surfaces without really giving you mechanisms to do that. And so it seems like it's problematic to add normative text to tell you something that's underspecified. Um, do we have comments here or do we know how to progress on this issue? Make sure we can wrap it up. I reviewed it. I was, I was happy with the conclusion. I, I think if we're going to publish this document, we need to publish it in basically the current form. Aside from that, twist okay. of the second thing. Do we want to? Because I mean, Ecker's comments in here are kind of saying we I've, shouldn't I've have talked to Ecker text. about this one. Look, we'll never be completely happy with this situation because we there's there's some fundamental yep. disagreements about policy, but those are policy disagreements, and not I I don't think that disagreements about what's what's in the draft. It's sounding to me of like, yo, if you can produce a new draft fairly soon and we can go to working group last call and see if we can make it stick. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So so not much further, Papa Smurf. <laughs> you can do it. You can do it. <laughs> Thank you, Yoff. Thanks. Okay. What is next? Um, so that was Digest uh, and uh, Client Hints. Using TLS 1.3 with H2, we've already sent that to the uh, IESG. There we go. Ah, Roberto, you had a comment. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Somewhat, yes. Okay. Uh, it was, well, uh, about the discussion before about uh, giving uh, feedback, uh, giving consideration uh, and guidance in using digest with signatures. Uh, all this digest draft started from um, me noting uh, bad implementation of draft cabbage using uh, digest in the wrong way for signing content. So the, the first thing I did was to better define uh, which fields uh, should be signed together with digest with metadata should be signed together with digest 
and then started working and rewriting the digest header. I think that uh, it's worth uh, when uh, specifying the digest draft to give guidance about using digest with signatures because actually there is an issue by uh, for the implementers uh, about all the contests and all the, the, the metadata that are part of the of, of the um, that are essential to uh, decode the, the the payload because the payload is not the representation. That that's it. Okay. Thank you, Roberto. Okay. Um, so next up, we have proxy status, but. I think it would be better to briefly talk about cache uh, header first because there's some changes there that might have impact on proxy status. Um, if you look at the latest draft, which I published pretty recently, um, we, we talked last time about uh, refactoring this because if you'll remember, the previous approach was very much pa paving the cow path of the cache, um, the X cache header. And so it had the very familiar cache hit, cache miss, um, and, and all the other tags. And, and the feeling was that that wasn't terribly uh, uh, extensible and, and, and adaptable to, to changes in cache semantics. And also, if, if implementations uh, uh, already implemented xcache, they could just try and change the header name and or, or, or not make any changes to where their code actually calls this and maybe get the semantics wrong. And so that was a bit of a moral hazard. And so we decided to, to refactor it. And I'd like folks to look, uh, when they have a chance, maybe not right now, at this reformulation, um, and I think there are some examples down here. Um, and, and I think this still needs some work. Uh, I wanna make sure that it's usable both for the implementations that are producing the header as well as people consuming it to do things with it. And I think we need to, to probably do at least one more revision for that latter class of people. But one thing I wanna highlight here is, is that we made a pretty fundamental change Last time there was a tag that kind of held the semantics of what happened, and then there was uh, parameters on that that were uh, identifying various parameters, including the name of the node. So what the name of the cache was that is, is claiming that this action has taken place. Uh, we flipped that, and the, um, the primary token here that you're putting parameters on is the identity of the, of the party taking the action. So in this case, it's, it's example cache. And then you know here, it's a fresh response and so forth and so on. And so I wanted to highlight that to folks to make sure that we're comfortable with that because I think we should probably do the same thing in the proxy draft. Uh, who's read the latest draft of this? It was put out a couple of weeks ago. Okay, if a few more people could read it and give feedback, that would be really helpful. I, I don't think, I'm, I'm not even sure there are open issues in this one yet. Let's take so there is one issue open for uh, refactor. Which I is, assume yeah. that is closed by this commit. Um, it was. It's just I'm not sure that it's sticking yet. I think we need to continue to refine refactoring. I didn't. That's why I didn't close it. Um, so please take a look and review. And I'm going to probably noodle on it a bit more. And we'll have another draft sometime soon. Any comments on the cache draft? We are. We changed the name, by the way. We did close that issue. It's cache status now. Ah. There, there was a old pull request open for that, so maybe that should be cleaned up. I think I did. But if I did. Alessandro Gedini in Cloudflare, you can oh, okay. also close my PR about renaming the ah, header. And there it is. Yes, thank you. Cool. Okay. And that takes us to proxy status. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Piero and I have been working on this in the background and having a chat. And we have two issues left. Um, we haven't. Uh, we did not publish a new draft before this ITF because we wanted to, to get to conclusion on these first. Um, and. Assuming that we can make the change we just talked about, I think um, this issue, we went to a place where we were talking about splitting it into two different headers. Proxy status to reflect the, the terminal, you know, this is an error generated by a proxy, and then proxy info to capture information that the proxy has observed on the way through. And I think that if we make that change that we made with cache status, we're not going to need to split it up in two. I'm, I, I suspect we're gonna be able to leave it into one header, which I think makes everyone happy. Um, sorry, is this uh, uh, about this draft? Cash. Which, oh, about cash. Oh, please go yeah. ahead. Uh, Chris Lemon says, I've read it. I really like the reformulation. I don't see the extensible case in there. I'd like to see a place to put some data about what kind of a hit it was. For example, a hit on disk, RAM, or some other place. I'd like to see proxy status to follow suit. 
Okay, that's good information. Thank you. Um, so if, if if that's the case, and we'll we'll do that refactoring uh, again on this spec, and then hopefully we'll be able to close eight twenty one without much change. Um, that leads us to eight oh eight, and um, there's a back and forth here. And Peter, feel, please feel free to come to the mic to represent your view. We've been talking the background a lot, and and there's there's a tension here. Um, I think you know one of the comments was that that being able to re identify request errors and different kinds of request errors uh, that are uh, currently uh, identified by HTTP status codes, <clears throat> you know, whether it's forbidden or, or URI too long or whatever, is useful to do here and to record here. Um, and so we, we started to walk down a path where we had a, uh, 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 a code for each of those states. And you can see I did a, uh, um, I started to do this in the draft itself. And so we have all of these new uh, uh, things associated with, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, here we go. All these new HTTP request ones from here down. One uh, uh, code for each existing uh, uh, HTTP status code. And uh, I'm not done with that yet. So I'm having misgivings about that. I don't want to represent Piotr's <laughs> position too much, but I'm having misgivings. We aren't able to come to agreement yet, so we wanted to talk about it briefly here. James Grusing, BBC. So what are you going to do when another HTTP status code comes along? I, I think the idea is, is that it would be registered in both the status code registry and here. So do you want to... I, I don't want to put my uh, so hand on the... So I think this was more of an issue uh, in current state when we have dedicated uh, types that are a primary object. If we do the refactoring and switch to uh, the proxy name being the primary identifier and switch this to us uh, to being uh, key values, right? Like status and status price, we don't, we can just piggyback okay. on an existing status code and don't need to redefine. So I think then it's fine. Okay. Hopefully. So um, that would take, I think we, we talked about this briefly. So that would take us to a design where um, we originally had one of these codes that was HTTP request issue or whatever. And then it had additional parameters that convey the status code and the status uh, phrase um, so that you can, you can find out. But you can also just look at the status code, of course. Um, I know one of your big concerns was that if, if there's another condition which isn't captured by a status code yet, you want to be able to convey that as well. Um, but I think that's probably just registering a new one of these uh, uh, error, I forget what we call them, but the proxy mm -hmm. error status things. Yeah, I think yeah. that's cool. Okay. okay. So I, th I think we can kind of write that down and see what it looks like and make sure everybody's comfortable with it and then move forward. But it, if we can solve these two issues, I think we're in agreement that we're pretty much ready to go, right? Yeah. Uh, it will be good to get the reading from the room whether everybody is against, you know, duplicating status codes. Yeah. Do you want to run a hum or? Sure. I mean, does I guess does anyone? I mean, does anyone want to speak up for duplicating them? Um, just so we can kind of hear a argument in that favor or. Roberto says. I commented on the issue, the status message, e.g. bad request, may change in time. Okay. So the status message could change, but the code wouldn't, presumably. Or... Okay. okay. All right. So, Martin Thompson, I, I, I think if you're making requests, then it makes perfect sense to just record the status code that you've got, if that's all the information that you have. Mm -hmm. If there's other error conditions that might be generated, then you have a other mm -hmm. values that you can have but i think having a having a i made a request and the and the status was x as part of the information that you provide which may even be in addition to the other errors that you uh, might stick in there is much cleaner and I, I just saw the table of contents as it scrolled down and just kept going and yeah, going 16. and going this is just unmaintainable so let's let's just return the status code so, so you're arguing for just status code, not what we originally had of both the status code and the 
the, the there may be other signals that you need to provide it in addition to that because of sure. processing that happened locally. But, Essentially, uh, just have the number, but but just the number would be okay, as the value of the as the of the parameter. Yeah, good. <clears throat> Do you want to take a hum on that, or uh, I'm I'm happy if Peter's happy. You happy? We have a, we have a path forward. I think we have a cool. path forward. Okay, okay I'll, cool. I'll I'll note that in the. <coughs> Excuse me. Can I drink that one? Yes. Uh, yeah. Put in a glass. Um. No, don't put. No. No. There you go. Service this place. Okay. Good. That takes us on. Thank you very much. Uh, that takes us on to variants. Um, I think also, again, a very brief update here. I don't know that we have any. Oh, we have one open issue on variants, I believe. Um, so, oh, no, we have a few. That's right. So in the last, uh, this sat for a long time, and, and we weren't sure. We, we weren't getting a lot of implementation experience, although we do see other specs depending upon it. Um, <coughs> the last time around, I posited that we might get a little more engagement from folks if it also addressed one of the most common cases that isn't met by the very header today, which is cookie variants. So I, in the last draft, I sketched in what that might look like. I don't think it's seen a lot of review. Who's read the latest draft of variants? Yeah, I don't think it's seen a lot of review. Um, so if people could please take a look at that, that would be fantastic. Um, there are a couple of uh, issues here which I think are pretty manageable. So my anticipation is I want to play with, I want to, I have an old implementation of this that I want to refresh, make sure it works properly, make sure that the draft is reasonable. And then I'm thinking we should probably publish this as experimental and see how that goes. Uh, we did have some implementer interest, but for a lot of reasons, it's not really getting that. And I don't want it to hang around too long. I'd be interested to hear if people feel differently about it, if they want to just keep it hanging around as a draft or, oh, I have an implementation or I'll do one honest or whatever. Martin Thompson, I realize this is probably drawing too long a bow, but the WPAC work was more or less depending on this one. I know. It would, it would, it seems like the outcome of that work would be to, ideally would be a standards track document. And having that standards track document depend on an experiment is a little awkward. I think we must, we, we might need to be prepared to revise this in a fairly short time span if, if it gets more serious over that way. I'm, I'm not, that, that's assuming a whole bunch of things that, that haven't happened yet, of course. I'm, I'm thinking that publishing as experimental might encourage some implementation. I know that sounds very hope-based. Yeah. Um, but if, if it need be, it can be flipped from experimental to standards track down the road with some process stuff. Yeah, yeah. I'm just highlighting that as a, as a potential problem. Sure. No, that, that, that's very much in my mind. <coughs> this is Jeffrey Yaskin. Um, in the WPAC, uh, kind of experimental implementations, we are suffixing variants with the draft number, um, which seems like a good way to future proof kind of the experiment. If it gets published as an experimental RFC um, and then needs changes before it goes to standards track, is there, we need to come up with a migration plan for the kind of whatever's, whatever's released. Sure, we'd have to come up with different header names if it needs changes, yeah, and that's not Terribly pleasant, yeah. I mean, uh, to be clear, I'm perfectly fine parking it for a while uh, if, if that lines things up a bit better. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody's comfortable with a park document for that long, because this has been hanging out there for a little while. I can live with that. I think we can, we can keep it around. Internet drafts don't expire, do they? <laughs> no. <laughs> Should they expire? I think was your question. I think it was in this very room. Um, okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I certainly I have issues to address. Um, it has a dependency on core, so it's not going to chip anytime soon anyway. Uh, I'll do a revision. I'll do some some prototype implementation to make sure that everything still works properly. Uh, but I I will put it on the shelf after that and wait for feedback. I think. And if there is implementation experience from the web packaging stuff, um, I mean, that may provide enough basis to make it not experimental by the time we publish. Right? Sure. I mean, personally, I'm not doing this for Webpack. Sorry, Jeffrey. I know that's a huge shock. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd like to see this used in anger by caches because I think it makes them more powerful. 
yeah, Martin Thompson, I, I'd agree with that. Any Anything we might learn in web packaging would be helpful, but I don't think it's going to be dispositive in any, any of this because this is targeted at intermediaries. And if in, intermediaries don't prove that they can use this, then I, we still don't know anything. Right. Okay. okay. I think that's all we need to really cover there. Um, BCB56, yeah. yes. We, we did get a comment. Yes, I got a comment, yes. and I've had a chat with Fluffy, and okay. I think... There's some editorial finessing there that might need to happen, uh, but uh, and I need to take another pass to the draft as okay. well. Well, good so, thing we left it open. Then. Indeed, thank goodness. <laughs> uh, wise chairs, indeed. Eventually, he'll he'll wake up to our trolling. <laughs> but, yeah. um, I I did a fairly large revision of this draft recently, probably bigger than I intended to, uh, and that's based upon the feedback we got in the process of putting RFC uh, seventy three twenty bis out. Um, which is the revision of the URI ownership stuff. And the feedback we got from the larger community in that was that it's fine to state some principles and state some practices and say this is you know what happens if you do this and this is why you probably don't want to do this. But using musts and, and, and must nots uh, to, to convey that is a whole other level and it's not usually appropriate uh, for these kind of architectural considerations. And so I did a, a pretty big pass to the document to uh, 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 remove a lot of the, what is probably gonna be considered inappropriate requirements language, tone it down and make it more, uh, you know, this is is why we do things the way we do them in HTTP. So I'd encourage people to review that. I probably do wanna take one more editorial pass through it, and it mm -hmm. still has this dependency upon core. Yeah. Has anyone looked at the more recent revisions of this? Anyone? Okay, I, I did take a look and it looked Reasonable, but I, I think once we get the any modifications from Fluffy's review in there, sure. we should ask everyone to take a look again. We'll de we'll definitely need to do another working group last call yeah. on this. And and you know, I after I did, I had misgivings about all these changes, but as after I did, I looked and I was happy with the document as a result. <laughs> well, that's a good outcome. Yeah, I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, random access is not our problem anymore, and it should be out the door as an actual RFC very very soon. It has. Uh, Secondary certificates. We are doing, I think we're a little ahead on time. We had 10 minutes allocated for this, but you can probably do 15 if we need. I actually don't think we'll take that long. Oh, wow. um, so there's not a whole lot that's happened in the document itself. Last time around, we finally came to a compromise on what we want to do for the DNS pieces. And really the outstanding piece right now is implementations. I'm aware of all of one implementation of this and it's server side only. Um, I have uh, two other possible interests in implementing that don't have a specific timeline, also server side only. I'd really like to see at least one client implementation before we progress this anywhere. And I don't feel like we can responsibly do that until someone does. Okay. Um, Martin Thompson, I'd really like to be able to implement this one, but it, it has remained below the the floor of various other higher priority things for for a long time. I think like the, the variance work, I'm comfortable parking this one. I don't want to publish this one as experimental. I don't want to I don't want to publish anything that hasn't been tested in mm -hmm. the field, in, particularly in this area. Mm -hmm. And there's there's a number of things in here that I think will require some care in order to get right, and we may want to make some sort of minor tweaks as mm -hmm. we as we go through deployments. So my preference here is to just say, okay, fine, it sits there, and it can sit there at the bottom of this list for the, the next three years if you really like we don't have any open issues do we um we have an editorial issue 15. and we need some uh we need the text for the compromise we worked out last time which is more or less do what you would do anyway yeah yeah so i i'm i'm comfortable with that i i want to make sure that the rest of the working group was comfortable as well because it these things tend to be a bit of a liability when they're they're hanging mm -hmm. around so mm -hmm. we, we need to acknowledge that <clears throat> Kyle Neckritz, um, I think I might have mentioned this last ITF. We have a like half completed client and server implementation, but um, yeah, 
there hasn't really been any movement on that um, in the past year or so, and I'm not sure there's going to be any any um, any time in, in the very near future. Um, but I have no problem with what the plan Martin suggested. Um, from what we did um, get done, we didn't find any kind of real issues in the spec, though. Yeah, I think not publishing and not killing is the, uh, sorry, Pat McManus, I think not publishing and not killing is probably the right um, path here. I, there are a number of use cases being sort of explored on this, but it's a it's a delicate thing to deploy even at a test level. So um, I certainly don't want to see it deprecated so we have something to work off of, but yeah, publishing it without the experience is probably a handy goal. Okay. okay. So it sounds like keep on going and we'll just see where it takes us. Thank you. Yep. Wow, it's loud. Yeah, it's loud. Okay, I expect CT. Um, that's an RFC now, isn't it? No. Mm, what's happened to that one? Not yet. Still in the RFC editor queue, I think. It's in okay. Misref. Misref. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. Yep. Structured headers. Um, so we have been chunking away at this. Um, our issues list. Um, we're just doing some, some I, I've done an editorial pass through it and there are a couple of nits left over. Um, the only real discussion we have left is around floats. We still have a little bit of discomfort around uh, exactly what floats are. And uh, uh, especially since, you know, the on-wire representation and the model for that is somewhat different from what people are using implementations and making sure we get those mappings correct. Um, so that discussion continues. I don't know that it makes sense to go too deep into that here, uh, but we do have a, a pretty active discussion there. I think we're going to probably rename float to decimal. Um, it seems to be that's that's the, the sense. If folks have thoughts about that, I'd love to hear it. Um, we do have multiple implementations. We have uh, our test suite with almost 1,500 tests in it now. Um, I recently got my implementation doing both the parsing and serialization parts, uh, uh, half of that working, which is great. And uh, I think it's being implemented at least in the serialization side in Chrome by in, in, in Cloud, so that's good. Uh, Martin. Yeah, Martin Thompson, I, I'm fully supportive of the move from float to decimal. I think dealing with floating point numbers in here is, has revealed a whole lot of complexity that in implementations that really isn't warranted for this. Um, I had a question though, where, where are you gonna put the decimal point? Well, so to be clear, the current proposal is just to change the name from float to decimal. Oh, well, that's, that's yeah. no good then. That's terrible. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, we discussed this at the last meeting and it seemed fairly clear that people were happy with the um, effectively a fixed point um, mm -hmm. decimal. Right. But what came up in discussion was that that would result in being unable to express certain types of information, uh, such as, for instance, uh, the number of nanoseconds since the Unix epoch uh, milliseconds would be equally bad, uh, I think. Maybe, maybe it was microseconds, I don't know. But um, that seemed to be the the thing that motivated the change to go to a floating point number. I think that's a bad decision. Yeah. And so I want, I want to talk about that a little bit. Because I, I don't think that, that really happened. That, that just sort of happened and, and, right. and it, it hit the rails and, and three people went off and charged away with it. And I'd like to have a discussion about right. that thing. Well, it's also interesting because the, the people who have been most active on this spec aren't in the room here and, and don't generally come here. So we have to be aware of that too. We have to be aware of that, yeah. yeah. Um, personally, uh, for me, the high order bit in this is that uh, if we have a float or a decimal type or whatever, it needs to be able to represent uh, uh, what's in current HTTP headers if we want to map them to structured headers, which mm -hmm. is, I know not completely in scope for this, but it's an intended future. Yep. Um, and that means mostly Q values, I think. I don't know of any other big places where, where decimals are used in HTTP headers, and Roy's getting up to correct me. So, yeah. so um, I'm, I'm getting the Sorry? from Q values. Q values. Yeah. Q values. Yeah. So um, I'm not getting from 
from that that we need a, a huge dynamic range on these values, yeah. um, which suggests that we could go with something a, a whole lot simpler. But uh, it seems like the discussion that went on, on on the list was quite quite firmly down the path of well, we need we need this bespoke floating point format. And, Chris Lemons asks, does anybody use more than two digits of precision for Q values? I think Q values are specified as three, if I remember correctly. Roy? Yeah, this is Roy Fielding. Yeah, it's, it's a three digit fixed point. Right. Hmm. So I guess, I, I guess the real question here is if we're going to express times as, as numbers, what do we, what do we think we might want to do in the future about that? Right. And, is that sufficiently different to the use cases we have for, say, Q values, that we can worry about that problem at that future time? Right. Well, well so to be clear, if we're, we're talking about backport, there, there are two cases for times. One is backporting existing time-based values in HTTP, like the date header, yep. last modified and expires. Yep. Yep. Those are all at one second resolution, so they're all going to be integers. So that's yep. fine. Easy. Until some day far, far, far in the future, because we've got 15 digits to work with. Yep. Uh, in integers in, in structured. Uh, and then there's if I want to introduce a new field that has something like null a second time in it. A, there's a question of whether that's a good idea, which has always been a contentious issue in HTTP. Yeah. Assuming that it is a good idea, you don't have to start with floating point. You could start with an integer and say this is an integer yeah. number of... Yeah. Yep. You're making my arguments for me. Thank you. Yep. That's why I'm here, Martin Thompson. <laughs> so... Uh, all right, so I think the proposal is, is to go to fixed point. How do people feel? Noted. Chris Lemon says, I observed that quite recently we defined some high resolution times as integer milliseconds. Mm -hmm. See the cache status header. And he is plus one on fixed point. Yep. And this is going to be a fixed point at what? I think it's three, three digits, three or six. And we have well, precedent for three if we want to make it backwards compatible. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this has been contentious, and I think it, it, it pro we can make a proposal on list. It's going to come up on list uh, or on the issue. Um, I'd like to get a better sense of the room personally. I think the precise number of digits is a bike shed. Uh, agreed. No. I mean about it being becoming a fixed point. So could we get a sense of the room? Yeah, I, I think you might want to want to do a hum on, on fixed point versus floating point on this one. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So we're going to take a hum. We're going to be two options. Um, first, we'll ask if people would like to switch to used fixed point for anything that is a fractional number. And then for the second question will be if you prefer to use <laughs> floating point as we do today and try to figure out that world. All right, so please hum now if you would prefer to switch to fixed point. And please hum now if you would prefer to use floating point. Okay, so for the minutes it was stronger for fixed point. There was some humming for floating, okay, but... I heard some. If, if anyone who hummed for floating point would be willing to come up and say why, that'd be really good information. Because mm -hmm. this is not a slam dunk, obviously. Um, or on Jabber, thank you. For fixed? For, 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 yeah. Well, the, the hum oh. was for fixed, but we're asking if there's feedback as to why people hum for flow. Yeah. Chris observes, it's worth noting that the floating point proponents are mostly out of the room. That, that's so... For me, I think I have an action to go and engage uh, with the other people who aren't here and who have been active on the spec, as well as the communities that have started to adopt structured headers because there are they are out there. I don't think any of them are using floating yet, but I want to double check and make sure that this doesn't cause concern in those communities. So um, we'll see, but for, from a interoperability standpoint, personally, I feel better about fixed. Uh, Roberto Pay on Facebook. 
a lot of, uh, well, there's a fair bit of hardware out there that doesn't even have floating point units. So it would make floating point even more challenging. It would get converted to fixed point on most of those platforms. Um, there is a really fun hardware uh, restriction for this. So I, I, in addition to all the other stuff. Uh, Julian comments, uh, an alternative solution uh, would be to get rid of it and define an extension later if needed. Yeah, I've, I've thought of that. I think uh, having it around for backporting things like QValue makes it valuable um, and for, for other couple of other simple use cases. But I, I'm much more happy I, or I'm becoming more happy with a kind of a limited value thing rather than making it so flexible. Yeah. Uh, I guess the argument against doing something like that is that this is fairly tightly coupled into the into the numeric serialization and parsing routines that that you have in the in the spec, yeah. and so having it integrated into the spec makes it a lot easier to be sure that people get that distinction between the two of them correct. Yeah. Whereas in an extension, we might have to think about having a different flag to go at the front of it. To, in order to properly distinguish it from other types of fields and that sort of thing. That's actually a very good point. Yeah, we we are. This is one of the few places where where we're exploiting that. Yeah. Julian says Q value can be sent as four digit int. Of course it can, but but it you know. So I have a separate draft which is not in scope for this working group now, which is how do you backport existing headers onto structured headers? And a lot of value, uh, a lot of headers use Q values, so it'd be nice to be able to not require different serializations of them. Uh, Jonathan Lennox, um, I'm wondering if it would, if the only use case for this is Q values, I'm wondering if a much tighter driver structure that can only represent values between zero and one, rather than arbitrary floating point, would be would be the right data type here. I'm seeing shaking heads, and I'm wondering why. Uh, I think if, if we're going to go to the point of describing something decimal, you know, saying, okay, well, fixed point, decimal numbers, that has utility still uh, without a lot of work. And, a little, and again, the, the interoperability profile is still pretty tight, so or just as tight. Mm -hmm. oh, I just want to check SH nits real quick. I think everything in here is done except for like, oh, yeah, that was the decimal thing. Mm. Yeah. So uh, please do have a look at the spec delta of that issue. Um, I think it's pretty much ready to go. We're going to have a couple more editorial passes through it just to make sure because it's hyper important that this one gets it right the first time out. Mm -hmm. Julian says, uh, what Mark just said is interesting as the goals for this spec seem to change from time to time. Smiley face. Uh, so is backporting existing header fields now a goal? As I said, it's not a goal for this spec, but it is an ulterior motive for a document to come. Yes. Okay. okay. And so, so schedule wise, when do you think we want to go to the I, last call? I this? would love to go to working group last call in 2019. Okay. The clock is ticking. Indeed it is. Especially since I have a holiday scheduled. <laughs> uh, Roberto Peon. I'll, I'll note that uh, the priorities stuff wants to depend on this. So yay, sooner. Yes, that's, yep. there are now a number of specs queued up for this, and so we're under a certain amount of pressure. Um, okay. Client hints we already discussed. 62, 65 bis. Um, oh. I think I need a closer seat. Uh, because we said, this is still Julian. Uh, because we Sorry, said, who? Julian. This is oh, still Julian. Julian uh, because we said last time, that the URI type is not needed because backporting was not a goal. Um, that's not correct. We said that the URI type was not needed because we couldn't define it with good, a good interoperability profile. And now I'm waiting for Julian's response. We did, we did close that issue previously, so I don't really want to open yeah. that one again. Thank um, you. So 6265bis is still an open document. Yep. Um, we still have a number of open issues on it, I believe. Yeah, we have 18. 18. Um, so uh, I think we're going to have a chat with the editors again about that and figure out yeah. how we can move that forward. I don't think we have anything to report at this meeting because there hasn't been any activity. Uh, but we need to see a way to uh, get that to conclusion somehow. Any okay. other comments on our open extension drafts? I think that covers everything. OK. So we're doing pretty well on time, actually. 
uh, compression mm -hmm. dictionaries. Um, oh, there we go. <laughs> Hi, my name is Felix Hanta, and I've written a draft talk that talks about the security properties of compression uh, with dictionaries. Next slide. So, why am I standing up here? Why is this interesting for HTTP BIS? Uh, compression is a crucial feature of HTTP, uh, though a, maybe a controversial one. Uh, as long as the web is made out of text, and particularly JSON, compression will continue to provide a great deal of value. Uh, next slide. So in pursuing uh, achieving the best compression ratio, um, the choice of algorithm plays an important role. But once you've done that, I believe that compression dictionaries are the next frontier. And as you can see, uh, we've seen pretty significant wins in deploying our own uh, content coding at Facebook. Uh, next slide. For those unfamiliar, uh, uh, for those unfamiliar, uh, dictionary-based compression is uh, this technique where you provide some external state to the compressor, and it can use that to produce a more compact representation of the message. Uh, when we're talking about uh, response body compression, uh, we're usually talking about an LZ compressor, so uh, the dictionary is basically content that you can make string matches against. So rather than having to represent some string in the compressed message, you can just emit a reference to the dictionary. Uh, there are other kinds of dictionary-based uh, compression algorithms. Uh, HPAC and QPAC are examples that may be familiar. Next slide. This technique does have drawbacks, and in particular, the blocking problem in previous attempts uh, has been concerns about introducing new security vulnerabilities. Uh, next slide. Nonetheless, I think this is something we should do. We should standardize and deploy a dictionary-based content coding. Uh, I hope to work with you all to do that in the future. Um, but it's become clear that first, in order to do that, we need to better understand the security properties of the domain. Next slide. So I have written a draft that attempts to do that. Um, that involves a few different things. Uh, it starts by looking at dictionary-based compression, as well as the machinery and choices that surround it that you have to make when you integrate it into an internet protocol. Uh, it lists. Uh, the security questions that arise as a result of both that compression and those surrounding uh, mechanisms. And finally, it uh, lists mitigations uh, where they're known. Um, so in investigating the security properties in this domain, I think there are two categories that are worth talking about. Next slide. Uh, the first is this existing class of attacks against compression, um, you know, which is the crime breach heist series, um, in which as an attacker, if you can introduce uh, data under your control into the same compression window as uh, user secrets that you're trying to discover, when they're compressed together, you can look at the size of the compressed message uh, and use that as a channel to extract information about that secret. Next slide. Uh, so this attack applies just as well to dictionary-based compression, uh, which is a concern, and actually possibly even more so because dictionary-based compression is precisely the process of taking two different pieces of content and putting them in the same compression window. Uh, so it potentially creates new avenues towards mixing attacker and user data. Uh, so that requires 
careful consideration. Next slide. Um, the other category, uh, sort of broad category that's worth talking about is uh, the security questions that arise from all of the other things you need to do to do dictionary-based compression. Uh, dictionaries are pieces of state, so somewhere you have to create them, you have to distribute them, uh, you have to agree with your counterparty which one you're going to use or if you're going to use one at all, uh, then you have to actually use it. And eventually at some point you want to learn whether it's safe to delete it or whether you still have to retain it. And so uh, the draft looks at whether there are security implications in those activities as well. Next slide. So this is the list of kinds of attacks that the document currently discusses. Uh, I tried to figure out how I could say more meaningful things about these uh, without using vastly more than my allotted time. Um, so instead, I will just refer you to the document which discusses them in some detail. Uh, next slide. And so that leaves uh, me with the question, uh, is this work, does this work belong in HTTP BIS? And if so, uh, what is the path towards adoption from here? Uh, so thanks, uh, next slide. Uh, I look forward to hearing your thoughts, questions, comments. Thank you very much. Um, so for, for folks who have been here for a while, you know that we've had this discussion in, in several ways over the years. Uh, there's a lot of folks interested in you know, doing dictionary-based compression in HTTP. Uh, there was always this roadblock of what are the security properties of it. And so thank you so much for, for doing uh, such a fantastic job in trying to write that down and, and document that so we can continue that discussion. Um, I don't know that we can come to any answers today, but I'd love to hear what people are thinking. You know, who's, Can we see a show hand who's read the document so far? Okay, so a smattering across the room. I'm hoping we'll have more people read it so we can continue that discussion. Go ahead, Brian. So I, I was interested in using it as well for a different protocol, but um, yeah, sure, great. I, I think it should be adopted. Yeah, and so one of the questions about the, the home for this is I think it's motivated largely by work that will happen in this group, but I did try to write the document uh, generically so it could apply to uh, any internet protocol. So there might be a question of, of at least coordination with the security area there um, to see if they want to take first pass at it or we can talk to our area director and talk to the security area directors and see what they think. Great. You didn't talk about this nest sec dispatch at any point, did you? No. Okay. Uh, any other thoughts from folks? Okay. Uh, I see thumbs up. Thank you again for doing that. Uh, and we'll, we'll have some background discussions to figure out what the next steps in that discussion are. Uh, but thanks again. So I think we have, we definitely have time permitting. Uh, we have one more presentation scheduled. James. Uh, did you want to talk a bit about the, uh, the, anyway, the extension things? After yeah, this. thank you for reminding me. We'll do that after this. We do have time. Go ahead. So I'm James Grusing. I'm from the BBC. Uh, I would like to introduce a new header to represent transport uh, information. Next slide, please. Uh, in, so, including various states like uh, you know RT, uh, the connections RTT, uh, the sender's congestion window, um, and I want to do this for a couple of reasons. Uh, it's for clients that can't get this directly, particularly for uh, JavaScript inside of web browsers, or perhaps revealing information about the connectivity between CDN and Origin. Um, there is already a W3 standard called net info, but for a bunch of reasons, it doesn't expose a lot of this information and it's not, uh, it's not extensible. Uh, we don't want to do this exclusively for TCP. Uh, we could do it for quick or anything else. Uh, and we also allow for multiple samples. So that, you, uh, that are all time and time based. Next slide, please. A couple of examples here really quickly. Uh, if, if you don't understand what I'm saying, that's roughly what they're looking like. Uh, next slide. Uh, there is a couple of issues in our 00 draft that we're already aware of, such as how to deal with uh, connect proxies, 
Um, ALPN might be problematic because uh, for non-H2 for H2 and lower, uh, the it's not clear. It won't be clear to the receiving end whether or not TLS is being involved. Um, our current representation of time is probably uh, over-engineered, uh, and there may be. It's not clear whether or not we're being clear enough about which fields are exhaustive or inexhaustive. Are, are you are you all done? I wanted to let you finish. I'm pretty much done. Okay, great. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Uh, Ian Sweat, Google, I, I had two questions. One is whether you considered uh, using this as a uh, request header as well, because there are use cases where you're an intermediary going back to a backend and you want to actually supply a different uh, response to the original client uh, based on the client properties. Um, and at least that's a plausible use case um, worth considering. Uh, the other question, of course, is um, trying to think of, I mean, this is this is presumably the last hop, right? So, like, you wouldn't want like if there was an intermediary, you wouldn't want the origin sending this back and then having the intermediary proxy it. Like, I don't uh, know. That's something There's, we also haven't defined yet. Yeah, oh yeah. Well, caching too, but like, let's like yeah. assume caching isn't. I just want to make sure. Like, this is kind of this is really only the very like last hop of the or I don't know. You might want to figure out like what hop it is. I guess really is what I'm saying. <laughs> Not anymore. Chris Lemons asks, uh, this information is mostly information that the browser already has access to, right? Is this motivated mostly as an end run around the browser choosing not to provide this information to the client? Uh, so going back to two of the motivations, the browser does have it, but the APIs that are currently defined, so uh, the net W3C net info, doesn't expose all of the values, and it's more focused around exposing some estimation of what the um, bandwidth or connectivity for the thing might be. And I think there's some privacy implications of exposing other values like RTT and friends because it's a basically figure printing. OK, and he, uh, and I do assume this header would be listed in the connection header? Uh, unsure. Yeah. That doesn't help in H2. <laughs> uh, Ted Hardy, clarifying question about what API surfaces you're planning uh, to have access to. Uh, in particular, I'm assuming from the discussion so far that you never plan to pass this out of the browser as additional information into something like an OS congestion controller or something like that. You're just going to use this for the information the browser needs for making decisions. It's not going any lower. Is that right? Uh, no, I don't think so. You think it's not right, or you think it's not going any lower? I don't think it's going any lower. OK, thank you. On the client side, at least. Yeah. Harun Marks, this seems like a very coarse grained signal. You're only yeah. getting this response, so you get a CBIND update every time you do a request, which seems not very useful. But what would be the use case for so, that? So uh, it's it's not completely coarse. The time value that we put in has millisecond resolution. However, that doesn't guarantee millisecond accuracy. Although there's some questions and concerns about whether or not that's the right thing. No, I mean the, the rate at which you get new values. Oh yeah, yeah, it's 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 coarse grain, right? It's not. This so is how, not how, how useful can that be? That's the question. Uh, for some of the use cases that we want to use it for, accurate enough, useful enough. Can you give an example? Uh, such as controlling how much data is being downloaded at a given point in time. Remember, CWIND is just one of the values, and that we would also look at using the RTT and RTT var, for example. I'm going to let Yov go next. Hey, hey. Um, so regarding net info, it is currently does expose the RTT and downlink, uh, like in download speeds as the client perceives them. Uh, but that is likely to be something that will go away due to privacy considerations. Um, but I'm not clear on the use case here. Are you aiming for the browser to use that information or the client to use that information in order to 
optimize uh, something, or is this something that will be web exposed uh, as a JavaScript API to the actual application? So JavaScript can already see headers through Fetch and XHR, right? Okay. Um, so, so JavaScript running in the browser can then go look at those, look at the results that it gets back from the server, and then make decisions based off of that, such as optimization of of what it's downloading. So if you see a huge fluctuation in RTT, for example, you see it go tenfold, then you know you should probably back off from downloading the next thing in line. Okay. Um... You probably want to look at the privacy implications of that. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the other thing about this is that this is the server will only reveal what it's configured to reveal. So if the if there's a particular concern over one of those values, well, then just don't transmit it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to cut the queue in a moment. So if you want to get it, please do. But go ahead. All right. Tommy, Polly, no hats. Um, so I would echo the privacy concern. I mean, this is not surprising. Um, and I, I think, I mean, looking at that, I think it is a very serious thing to think about. And maybe it kind of calls into question if this is exactly the mechanism you want. And maybe it would be good to like look at what are those, what is really the problem we're trying to solve, and are there other ways of signaling we can do to get that effect? That's already been brought up a little bit, because, for example, giving the RTT, that RTT is going to be an estimate based on previous connectivity. Um, which particularly is not going to be very rich at the beginning of a set of connections. And then later on, we'll indicate the past and not necessarily what is going to be coming up. Mm. Perhaps what we could do, and I'd love to understand the use case more, is have indications from the server saying, hey, it looks like I'm having trouble getting stuff back to you at the rates I would like to. And if you as the client are not adapting to that, it's a hint almost from the server to the client to say, maybe you should back off or something. So maybe find a way to make this explicit rather than relying on lower level measurements that may not really map well onto the semantics of HTTP would be more effective in this case. Okay, we can talk offline about that. Uh, Ian's right, Google. I want to comment that, yeah, see when you cannot actually uh, get obviously locally because it's the peers congestion window. So that yeah, seems yeah. like a totally reasonable, it's not just doing an end run around the browser. Um, I do wonder, I'd also be curious why you want to standardize this because I think you can just do this now and not standardize it. So that's right. Uh, uh, because I've seen lots of different implementations do this in very different ways. That's all. The queue's cut. Go ahead. Um, this is just an observation. This seems like the kind of thing that would fit in well with um, sending headers at any point within a request or response. So would you expect to be able to send multiple of these per uh, response if that was technically possible? Uh, yeah, I assume so. Yeah, okay. And and on that note, the, the issue that Roy created, um, Piotr uh, provided a link to something called a metadata frame that could also refer to the connection, but carry a header like that. So you could get connection level statistics rather than just connection level statistics related specifically to a request or response. Right. Chris Lemon says, uh, it sounds like the browser has explicitly decided that this information isn't data that it wants to provide an API to. I'm not sure an end run around that decision is advisable without fully understanding the reason browsers are making that decision. Um, Patrick, so I mean, I think some of this is stuff the browser isn't providing, but some of it's also information that's really only on the server that it's sharing through this, and that's you know interesting. Um, what's the relationship between this and like server timings? Sorry, I'm not familiar with it. Okay, it's an API to provide server timing information. Not terribly unlike this. Um, so you might look at that. Um, Sea wind is probably not what you want. That's going to vary between congestion control algorithms, like how to interpret that. Um, like that means maybe a slightly different thing, like in BBR, than it does in Reno and that kind of thing. You might be more interested in delivery rate and that kind of thing as a, as a bandwidth metric might be much more actionable and have a semantic value rather than just a, a raw number. Um, and I had another, what, I didn't read the spec, I'm sorry. 
So there's but other the values in there that might be might be helpful for this. Like we have also included so all of the fields with the exception of uh, the the first the first value. So the the name of where this is coming from and the time. Everything else is completely optional. Uh, and some of the other values include what congestion control algorithms are you using? BBR? Are you using something else? Um, if you have a look at most of the values inside right. of but one of the things we've learned, like in HTTP, is you want to concentrate on the semantic rather than the the, the real instance of that, right? So okay. you don't want to say it's BBR and it's CWIND and you figure that out. You want to like, yep. what's the what's the semantic of how much bandwidth do I have? That's like kind of the usual way. What does TS mean? I mean, it's a timestamp, but what is it timestamping? Uh, that's supposed to be Unix epoch second uh, milliseconds of what? I mean, what's the event of uh, the time that those values were sampled? Okay. <laughs> and and. Just selfishly, you only need two digits of precision there. <laughs> I think it should be three. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so, so this was a, a last-minute addition. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think from what I'm hearing, folks want to understand more about your use cases. So maybe okay. focus on that a little bit. Okay. Uh, mailing list or mailing list sounds like a the next, right. the next step. Yeah. We'll do that one. Thank you very much. Okay. So one more uh, last-minute addition, uh, Roy. Uh, wants to talk about an issue that we opened on core as a result of other discussions. Do you want to open it up? It's 986 on extensions. On extensions, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I figured that's where you'd want it. Um, so this is the idea of, of defining an extension to HTTP2 and eventually quick that would allow us to send metadata midstream in a request or response. And um, so I described uh, what I meant by that in the issue, which I'll skip ahead and, and we look down below. The use cases, um, there's a number of different things that we could use this for that I just went through my list of, of history stuff from over the years and uh, progress meter, midstream timing, like server timing, just like we just saw. Um, Priority updates, um, like we're talking about in the priority draft, except we're doing it a different way in the priority draft. Um, Non-critical path metadata, which is basically, it's metadata that you you would like to send, but you don't want to send it in front of the body because you don't want to you don't want the time, you don't want the uh, user performance to suffer because of all the metadata you're sending in front. So you send it after you send most of the, of the body. Um, that's very it was a, a critical problem with the alternate header field when it was defined for reactive content negotiation. It was just too big. Um, and uh, it's also useful for things like link preload. Um, you can send that information after you figured out, oh, hey, this is the pattern. Like if you're using um, uh, algorithms to figure out what the client is actually um, performing against your site, you can use those algorithms to anticipate what uh, you might want to push to the client or what they might want to pull ahead of time. And these are algorithms that aren't necessarily going to complete before you send the header fields. So you might want to just send the result of that in, in the body, things like that. And the long poll, um, things that aren't related to a separate channel. Those are all use cases. So as it turns out, we I, I put this on the list last night and Piotr pointed out a, it's already been implemented. Wow. Um, go up a little bit. No, the other direction. Oh, the other one. <laughs> the other one. The one called down. It's, well, you people put um, the So uh, in the Envoy proxy, um, there is apparently already a HTTP2 extension called metadata using the frame type 0xd already, um, which is just a Google Doc about how to do this exact same thing. Uh, yes, they're just camping on it. Um, <laughs> That's not cool. <laughs> but I won't be mean to them because they just saved me a lot of work. <laughs> anyway, this is almost exactly what we want, uh, with the exception of you know describing what it is. What do you do with this metadata um, when you receive it? So um, once we hopefully I'll get in touch with the authors of this document, and um, we can put together a draft to define this. For real, we might as well use that 0xd value, but 
you know what it's the next one available anyways um, and we can put this together as an internet draft and get it done by two months and uh, we'll go to last call the next ITF so, so Roy just one clarification when I said open an issue um, I did mean on core Oh, you did? Yeah, because I think the important thing to clarify is right now in core, we say that the, the abstract model of HTTP is you have headers, and then you have body, and then you have trailers. And we need a clarification that trailers might come early. Uh, it's already in the spec. Well, then we should talk about that. OK, good. Hmm. Uh, Ian Sweat, Google. I'm fairly sure I know the authors of this extremely well. Um, also, I think it turns out that in our implementation, we support this already. Um, <laughs> well, in the, in the mo if we support trailers, we support it. Um, I think the people who implemented our HTTP2 implementation actually thought this was allowed, even though they thought it was completely bizarre. Um, and then the last thing was, uh, they, I, I would recommend we call these middlers, because the, that's just so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> that was what they were introduced to me as when this was talked about a year ago internally, when we were like, you can do this. Please and I'm no. like, that's great. <laughs> Please no. Uh, so first, a clarifying question, Roberto Peon. Um, is this meant for HTTP 2, HTTP 3, HTTP 1? This one is, is HTTP 2, um, given the progress they've made. There, I, this, this particular issue is for HTTP 2. There's another one for QUIC, um, which doesn't have any of this discussion on it, but is referenced from this issue. Um, so, so, yes, but not for H1, because I tried to do that in H1, and it's too painful. I, I remember, and I'm very sad that we still don't have uh, chunk extensions, but anyway. Um, there are some very fun questions around the semantics of some of these things that I think are going to take longer than two months to answer. Like, are these placeholders uh, within the entity body that's being conveyed, or whatever we call it these days? Um, do they, when they are forwarded, do they have to be forwarded? Do they have to be in the same location when they are forwarded? When we're doing HTTP 3 or a quick version 2 that's doing partial reliability, um, are these about the stream or within the stream? Becomes a really interesting, fun question. Um, so these are the things that I'm a little worried about with, with regards to this, because it could be fantastically under spec if we don't think about that. So do you want to be a co editor? What was that? Do you want to co edit it? I can try, but good luck. <laughs> yeah, do it. Robin. Yeah, Robin Marks, uh, same question about HTTP 3, and I want to say that this looks very interesting in terms of priority updates. Indeed, I can, we, we've been talking a bit about uh, range priority, uh, priority changes per range of resources, and I think this could be used to do that on the fly. So, interesting stuff. Uh, firstly, I think this is very useful for uh, servers sending traders mid-response. On the other hand, I actually wonder if this would be useful for sending priority updates hmm. because priority updates are expected to be sent after the client closes the request and it could arrive after the server has completely send the response. So if we are going to use that, it means that the server needs to retain the connection uh, stream state forever. So I'm not sure if it can be used for that purpose. Uh, to be clear, my, my intent for these is, is only for metadata that can be dropped silently. Um, so purely optional metadata. Yeah. Martin Thompson, I, I, I think that's fine. And priority would be would fall into that class. But I think uh, Kazuo's point, and, and it particularly applies to something like Quick, is if you put this in the middle of the request stream, the request stream is long gone by the time that you need to um, have that information updated. So it's not going to be useful for priority. Um, I got up to oh, say right. um, for H2 because for H2 the, it would work because the stream goes away because yeah. the stream sort of still is, is there, but in, in, in quick, it wouldn't, uh, I got up to basically say, uh, camping, uh, <laughs> um, new frame type, uh, and H pack no is, uh, so there's going to be a different spelling of this. I think if we, if we want to pursue this, at least that would be my preference. Uh, mm. I can see how this, how, how the decisions that led to this are all rational and perfectly reasonable, but I think there's a different spelling of this that would be a little better, particularly the, um, the compression thing. I think we should be compressing these. 
because it that will allow us to do some much more powerful things. I, no. I believe they don't did not do that because it would interfere with the uh, the compression algorithm, possibly without either end knowing it. There's be, because this doesn't negotiate the use of this frame type. Mm -hmm. It um, means that you cannot change the HPAC state, mm -hmm. but if you negotiate it with the setting, you can, and so um, that would be that would be superior, I think. Uh, you, you, uh, Roberto points out that you can still uh, reference the, uh, the the compression state. Worth considering. In, yeah. in H2 at least. <laughs> yeah. Julian asks, should we talk about assignment of frame type numbers? Uh, I believe, Julian, it's it's under I, under restricted to IETF review. So basically, the, the actual assignment would have to be a completed document from the IETF. Um, I'm just, it's, I mentioned that just because I think it's kind of funny whenever somebody just ignores the actual process and goes ahead and assigns the next unassigned standard mm -hmm. number because it happens all the time. No matter what the IETF says, <laughs> it happens all the time. We should give away chocolate. That might help. <laughs> we should make them give away chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wait a minute. Mark Nottingham, um, I, I, I don't have strong feelings about how this should be spelled on the wire. I do think it's interesting and I do think it's useful, but I look at the history of trailers and the, the trail of trailers and um, it's a trail of tears. It is, it is really painful. Um, it is, you know, we, we, I think we're in core, we are now just getting to the point where uh, we understand how trailers work and have some recommendations of how to make them really useful and interoperable and implementation is still really trailing. I keep on doing this, <laughs> sorry. That was an intentional. <laughs> yep, <laughs> I'm not that good. <laughs> um, I am really scared if we introduce a new thing that is not like trailers, it's gonna destroy both the new thing and the old thing because most developers aren't gonna get it and it's gonna get misimplemented, and it's not gonna be available in a backwards compatible fashion. So I'm fine if this is just basically trailers that happen to arrive early. And as long as you can treat them like that and they work within those constraints, that's, I think, pretty tractable. If it's some new extra thing, uh, a bump on the model of, of the abstract model of HTTP messaging, I just think we're over-designing and it's gonna fail. Yeah, I, I'll i agree with that. I mean, it's it's painful enough to get to the point where we are in draft 06 in, in HTTP core, which does incorporate that um, for trailers. Um, and so I would like to stick with that and no further. Petsukara Google. Uh, it's worth pointing out that this was originally designed as basically internal hop by hop headers or trailers, right? Whereas uh, I'm not sure if the case you're after is end-to-end -end trailers, right? Yes. And it's, it's worth pointing out like those have some different properties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, one, one of the first things we would have to work about is how to, how to um, self-describe the, the header fields that are sent such that some are connection-based and some are end-to-end. Um, -end. But, that's a, that's a, but that's a very old HTTP problem. Yeah, but is, yeah. is there any reason not to use headers or like, you know, uh, trailers? Uh, for end-to-end? -end. Do we need new frame for end-to-end -end trailers? Basically? I don't think we would need a new frame. I think we, we would just need to identify which ones uh, you want to drop immediately on receipt. You can't use trailers, that's the only thing. Yeah, because it'll mess up the back uh, context. It has to be something different. No, no, I'm saying for end-to-end. -end. Understood. Right, it's one of the reasons why it's it's de defined currently in their doc yeah. document as a as a literal non-indexed yeah. header field, so it doesn't mess up the. Okay. And we're cutting the lines after this. Mike Bishop, um, I will I will say that I don't really have a problem with trailers that arrive early. Um, I think the more challenging thing is going to be the fact that you then might also have trailers that arrive at the normal time. And what do you do with more than one set of trailers or potentially lots of sets of trailers over the course of an HTTP message? 
Uh, Personally, I thought they'd just combine. I think that's the whole idea. Yeah. They they just keep going. They're the trailers. It's just one big set. Yeah. Uh, Lucas Pardew, I think kind of related to that, and, and there's probably already an answer to this, but I really wonder how this gets exposed to something like Fetch. Um, in, in like, if I don't know when when that set will be bounded and finished, like how how much time do I keep waiting to process a, a headers object um, and, and the implications of that. So I, I think we should think about that while we try and spec something up because user agents are all the same, but they have different APIs. Yeah. I. I, I'll agree with that, Lucas. And that um, the one of the reasons why we were uh, why we went through all of the trailer specs and moved into semantics and 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 just defined it the way we did was to um, correspond to some of the feedback that we got from Anna about from Fetch that he he actually wanted it to be in separate trailers separate trailers from header fields so you have you have header fields that you know up front and then you have trailer fields that you don't know up front and to not mix those two the way we had described before for hp1 mm -hmm. and as painful as it is to go back and just revisit that decision the reality is is the way he described it is is easier for people to implement now and um less security issues so we actually went ahead and made that change. And I think hopefully um, in the same way Anna will look at this and, and be able to come up a, with a reasonable design or someone uh, to do that. I'm certainly not gonna try to design the browser side for them. Okay, um, so the reason I ask is because fetch isn't just within the browser context, but is used in, in other places, so. It's, it's, you need the APIs. I know it's supposed to be cut, but yeah. Um, if there is not a demarcation of the end of the body of sets of key values, then in the case where there are multiple header values repeated, they may be misinterpreted. So I, I think that there's a problem there we have to resolve. Yeah. Okay. Can we just ask, show of hands, who's interested in, in this discussion in general? Good portion of the room, so we need yep. to figure out a way to, to keep it going, I think. Okay. Yeah. And do we think this work, I mean, because we want an issue on core just to clarify things, but I, that's not where the work is. I want to check, well, I think we can be more clear in core, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then, and okay. the, but it would be an H2 an extension, maybe an H3 extension, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank all you, Roy. Right. Um, I think that's all we have. I think so. Um, it, it, Sorry, one thing. Uh, I in, in when I was up at the mic, I used the phrase "trail of tears" and I did that unintentionally. That is a historical event that I wasn't trying to refer to, and so apologies for any offense caused. Um, it was just the words that came to mind at the moment. Um, I think we're done for the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Okay. We will see you in Vancouver. All right. <laughs> Funny you are. <arrived>. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, the Friday before. Sorry. The, the, I, I'd say. Yeah. 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 I, Thanksgiving, but yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hey, guys. Long time to see. Yeah. yeah. So. I'm just sending out the call for adoption yes. right now. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Give them to me. Of course. Oh, if anyone wants HTTP3 stickers, we have plenty. <laughs> <laughs>